In previous installments in this series, it has been my practice to discuss each polis individually. However, when I got to Boeotia, it occurred to me that due to the intertwined nature of the entire region, that it wouldn't really make much sense to discuss any polis in Boeotia without a reference to Boeotia as a whole. Therefore, what I've done here is to study Boeotia as one unit and then break it down into four different polis, which were major players on the Boeotian scene. We'll look first at Boeotia as a whole and its general history. Then we will look more specifically at the histories of Orchomenos, Plataea, Chironea, and Thebes. Orchomenos and Thebes, of course, competed for hegemony in Boeotia, whereas Plataea and Chironea were not by themselves strong enough to really accomplish much. However, each of them was the site of historically significant events, and both of them would have their own role to play in the broader framework of Greek history. So without any further ado, let's look at Boeotia's geography. Boeotia is the beating heart of central Greece. This is some of the richest farmland in the entire Greek world, and it is in the middle of any invasion into or out of the Greek world. It should come as no surprise, given the centrality of Boeotia and the relative richness of its land, that nearly every center here corresponds with at least one famous historical battle. Tanagra in the east, for instance, was the site of a major hoplite clash between Athens and the Boeotians in 457. Thebes is fairly far to the east and south. You can see it here on your map. It's written in Greek. There is also Plataea right on the border of Attica. To the far west of Boeotia, we have Orchomenos near the lake. And then as we sort of move toward Phocos, we see that there is the city of Chironea. The cities I've chosen are ones which are historically significant for reasons that I will get into but I easily could have covered more of these cities had I been so inclined. Coronea and Tanagra come to mind. Much of the land surrounding Boeotia is rocky and not terribly fertile. However, Boeotia is both rich in terms of its farmland and its pasturage. The land is not completely flat, however, and if anything, more of Boeotia consists of rolling hills than it does of flat plains. There are, of course, famous flat plains where battles were fought, but most of Boeotia is not quite that easily accessible. Boeotia literally translates to English as cowland, and should come as no surprise that it was known for rich farms that you could plunder and steal cows from. Boeotia is also the center of overland trade in the Greek world. Seven gated Thebes, for instance, had trade coming in and out of every gate pretty much on a daily basis. The abundance of food meant that Boeotians were noticeably larger than most other Greeks. In fact, we see this in the uh, graves and remains of uh, dead Greek men. We notice that Boeotians on average would have been about two inches taller than the average Spartan or Athenian, and that they also would have been anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds heavier. So this uh, abundance that Boeotia enjoyed was something that is quite obvious from the physical remains of the people of this area. All of the Boeotians claimed a common ancestry and they saw themselves as being an intimately related people. However, this did not prevent them from quarreling with one another over the course of several centuries. Taken as a whole, Boeotian history on an internal level was a more or less constant struggle between Thebes, which was seeking regional dominance, and the other polis led by Orchomenos, which sought to maintain their independence or else maintain a balanced federal arrangement where Thebes had a lot of influence but was by no means completely and totally in control. So that's a dynamic we'll see play out over and over throughout the history of Boeotia. All Boeotians claimed a common descent from Cadmos, who we will discuss in more detail. He is the mythical founder of Thebes. They also claim that they have the blood of the previous inhabitants before the arrival of the Phoenicians, the Actinians, the Iones, and the Spartoi, who we will also discuss in slightly more detail in just a moment. 
The Boeotians together held a Boeotia-wide festival every 59 years in honor of Hera. This was called the Great Daidala. Boeotian tradition held that the entire region had been conquered by Cadmos, who was a Phoenician royal prince from Tyre, who had gone to Greece in order to avoid strife at home and also to seek out fame and fortune abroad. Cadmos and his followers were able to conquer the locals and then integrate them with his own people and found the city of Thebes, which would then become effectively the capital of Boeotia. I think it's safe to assume that the Cadmos myth was primarily promoted by Thebes and they used it as a way to promote their control over the region as a whole. After losing most of his fellow Phoenicians early on, Cadmos was forced to sow the teeth of a dragon or serpent that he slayed, and these teeth came to life as the so-called Spartoi. The Spartoi are not to be confused with the Spartans of Laconia. The Spartoi are just people who rose up from these teeth, and that was their only significance. The conquest of Cadmos was dated to several generations before the Trojan War, so this is something which was supposed to have taken place in the very distant past, and for the Boeotians, this was something like their first historical event. To stick with Boeotian mythology for the time being, after several generations, Cadmos' family was temporarily displaced from the throne when a young King Laos was usurped by his supposed caretakers. However, a plague struck Thebes and killed the usurpers, thus allowing Laos to return with his queen. Laos received a warning that his son would one day grow up to ruin him and steal his wife. Laos accordingly decided that the best course of action for both himself and for Thebes was to have this new baby exposed, the baby of course being Oedipus. The infant, however, was found by a local shepherd and then taken to the childless royal couple of Corinth where it was raised as the prince of the Corinthians. Oedipus grew up as an adult and he went out on a journey to visit Thebes, ostensibly as an envoy. However, along the way, he encountered an arrogant man who ordered him to get out of the street and had a bunch of attendants. Oedipus's blood boiled hot, he was a young man with a lot of fighting skill, and he took on and destroyed the entire contingent, including the important man in the chariot. Oedipus then went on to Thebes, where he learned that the queen was now a widow, so he married Eocosti or Epicosti, depending on which name you prefer, and they had four children together. Apparently, it wasn't odd to anyone that they were not very age compatible. Usually Greek men would marry younger women, but at any rate, she was still fertile and they had four children together. And then the truth came out. Not only had he married his mother and fathered children by her, but he also slain his own father. This created the curse of Oedipus, and it would cause his sons and grandsons to be beset by many woes. The so-called the curse of Oedipus would result in instability in Thebes and throughout Boeotia throughout the rest of mythological history. Oedipus, once he learned the truth of what he had done to and with his own parents, was absolutely horrified and decided that he couldn't live with what had happened, so he blinded himself, went into exile, and died not long after. In the meantime, however, he arranged for two of his sons to succeed him on the throne of Thebes, and for someone who was known to be wise enough to answer the riddle of the Sphinx, he proved himself to be quite inept at coming up with a plausible solution for the problem of having two male heirs. He decided that his sons Ateocles and Polynices should alternate years on which they rule Thebes. And while this worked for a few years, eventually one of them, Ateocles, decided that he was sick of sharing power with Polynices, and so he refused to hand over the throne on the appointed date. Polynices, of course, was not willing to accept this outcome, so he traveled to Argos to raise an army with which to claim his birthright. This would lead to the famous incident, the Seven Against Thebes. Each side would have seven distinct forces. Each one was tasked with capturing or defending one of the seven gates of Thebes. This would result in a massive battle, 
and the death of all of the captains involved. Of course, this made for an epic story, and this was not lost on later Athenian playwrights like Aeschylus. Aeschylus, in fact, wrote such a good play about the Seven Against Thebes that he won first prize the city Dionysia in 467 for his play on this very subject. And, as we'll see later, the Thebans were a common motif in Athenian plays, believe it or not. For the ancient Greeks, the line between myth and history was rather thin, and it had a lot more to do with the passage of time than with what we might think of as fact versus fiction. Accordingly, we should always be very cautious when we try to equate mythological stories with any kind of real history. There are scholars who would go a lot further than I would in trying to relate the ocean myth to vague memories of the fall of the Mycenaeans, the Dorian invasion slash migration, which by the way is a whole can of worms onto itself, and the central role of the Phoenicians in the rise of Greek culture after the Dark Ages. I would counter such scholars by pointing out that Boeotian mythology on an objective level does not get the chronology of this anywhere near right, so it would be very difficult to really say that they had any actual memory of any of those events. One thing we definitely can do with mythology, however, is use it as a guide to understanding how various poles identified themselves and saw their own origin stories. This was part of an ongoing process, this formation of identity. We see that when we look at the Athenians, they were constantly tweaking and changing their origin story and their mythology to fit whatever time they were living in and to fit the circumstances. The Boeotian origin story, which involves Cadmos and a great Phoenician migration, stands in stark contrast to what we see in Athens, where there's the story about autochthony, which becomes more and more elaborate over time. The Athenians become more and more insistent that there was a Dorian invasion elsewhere in Greece, but that they were unaffected, and that they are the only truly pure and native people in all of Greece. It would appear that the Athenians became more set in their view of their own autochthony as they came into harder conflict with the Thebans to their west. As for how the Thebans may have altered their own story to uh, strike a stronger contrast with their own neighbors, that is unfortunately not knowable given the current state of the evidence. As is the case for nearly every major polis on the Greek mainland, there are Mycenaean remains at the major sites. Both the Cadmia at Thebes and then the Acropolis of Orchomenos show extensive Bronze Age activity. It would appear, if anything, that Orchomenos was perhaps the more important of the two sites. Orchomenos not only had a grand palace on its Acropolis, but it also had enough organization and political will for the inhabitants to drain a large lake in order to create a fertile area for agriculture, which would be an impressive undertaking in any period of antiquity, but especially the Bronze Age where there weren't iron tools for digging and irrigation. Since Orchomenos did impressive work during the Bronze Age, I feel that it is fitting to start with them in our exploration of the chosen Boeotian cities. The Orchomenians claim descent from a people called the Minions. We know very little about the Minions for certain, except that they were not miniature, they weren't yellow, and they had two eyes rather than one. Orchomenos was located in the northwest corner of Boeotia, and this was an advantageous spot for them since it gave them enough distance from Thebes that they had plenty of warning if the Thebans decided to march on their city. Orchomenos would fight fiercely both for its own independence and to establish its dominance over some of its nearby neighbors. By 600 or so, Orchomenos had been forced to join the Theban-led Boeotian League, but it served an important purpose and prevented Thebes from completely dominating that league. It was always the second city of Boeotia, and it could pretty much always at least temper what Thebes was trying to do in terms of steering Boeotian politics. During the classical period, Orchomenos was the home of games in honor of the Muses and a festival called the Agrionia, where 
so far as we know, the main event was a man dressed up as Dionysus getting drunk and chasing around women. So basically, this was St. Patrick's Day, and uh, a pretty good one too. I have not yet had the pleasure of playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey, however I did happen to find a screenshot from that game of the city of Orkominos, and I was pretty impressed. Based on what I've seen of Orkominos from other pictures, this actually is a pretty reasonable reconstruction of what the city may have looked like during its prime. So hats off to the people who made Assassin's Creed Odyssey for creating such a relatively realistic graphics engine. On a previous slide where I showed a theater from Orkominos, I did not tell you who actually built that theater. The theater was built by Alexander for reasons that we're going to get into now. Orkominos, not surprisingly, was not a big fan of Thebes when Thebes began to assert its dominance over the Boeotian League and took the Boeotian League into a war with Sparta in 395, that of course being the Corinthian War. Orkominos decided to side with Sparta and remain loyal to the Peloponnesian League during that conflict. I have to imagine that given the fraught nature of the war where Sparta's main army under Agesilaus was many miles removed from Sparta itself, that having Orkominos on their side was a key factor in managing to stave off defeat long enough to get back to Greece and get organized to fight this conflict. Thebes did not forget Orkominos' role in that war, however, and when a democracy had been established in the early 380s and then the Thebans had defeated the Spartans at Leuctra and by liberating Messenia, they then turned their attention to their old rival at home, Orkominos. In 364, the Thebans destroyed the city and the Orchomenians were effectively orphaned. The city was then restored by the Phocians, the neighbors of the Boeotians to the west, and 355, but the Thebans got organized once again and were able to destroy Orkominos one more time in 349. In 335, when Alexander suddenly returned from the Danube, Orkominos decided to take his part in the war with Thebes. Again, this should come as no surprise since Thebes had thrown off their Macedonian garrison and now were facing down the shaft of Alexander's spear. Orkominos joined the winning side, and because of their loyalty to him and the dire straits they found themselves in, Alexander decided to reward them lavishly after he destroyed Thebes. He gave them money, and that money helped to build the extant city walls and theater. However, this would be the last great building period of Orchomenian history, and after the time of Alexander, Orkominos more or less fades into obscurity. Perhaps the Boeotian city most similar to Orkominos is one located on the other end of that territory. This would be the city of Plataea, which was right on the Attic border. Much like Orkominos, Plataea was determined to retain its independence and to resist the orbit of Thebes. Unlike Orkominos, it didn't have much space between itself and Thebes, and it was also significantly smaller and weaker. That being said, Plataea was no teacup poodle. It was, by the standards of the Greek world, a reasonably powerful state, albeit not one on the same level as Thebes or Athens. Plataea had a reasonable amount of prosperity, and as I said, it was powerful enough to, to control its immediate neighborhood. It also happened, however, to be in the middle of the invasion routes for the Persians and later for the armies of the Peloponnesian War. So Plataea would often find itself in the middle of any battle which might spring up between Athens and Thebes, between the Spartans and the Athenians, or between the Persians and the Greeks. At Marathon in 490, Plataea made perhaps the boldest and most important decision in its entire history when alone among the Greeks, it decided to support the Athenians 100% in their quest to fend off the Persian invasion force led by Datis and Artaphernes. Plataea sent a full 1,000 hoplites to Marathon, where they fought shoulder to shoulder with their 10,000 Athenian hoplite neighbors 
and to the shock of the world managed to drive off the Persians. This of course meant that Plataea was now on Xerxes' official shit list when he invaded in 480 and this would be something which would drive Plataea forever into the arms of the Athenians and forever out of the good graces of the Thebans for reasons that we will see shortly. When Xerxes invaded Greece in force in 480, there were only a handful of Greek powers to whom he offered no succor. Athens, because of the Battle of Marathon and their previous role in the Ionian Revolt, was offered no chance to surrender. Sparta had also kicked an ambassador down a well, which was a violation of religious laws and norms, so they too were not offered any terms that were favorable. However, Thebes had done nothing to Persia, so Thebes had the option to surrender. What Thebes would have done had Thermopylae held is unknown, but most likely they would have participated in the resistance. As it was, after three days, the defenders of Thermopylae led by Leonidas were overrun by superior numbers of Persians, and this left all of Boeotia open to a flood of Persian invaders. Thebes decided to surrender. This was, for them, the logical move. Later on, this would prove to be a fatal decision for them, but at the time, it seemed like the logical course of action. They had no reason to suspect that their fellow Greeks would ever be able to drive off the Persians. And by Medizing when they did, and being the most powerful state to Medize, the Thebans thought that surely they would gain something from this. In 479, following the victory at Salamis, the Greek alliance led by Sparta and Athens advanced from Corinth to face off against the Persians now led by Xerxes' cousin Mardonius. While this Persian army was quite a bit smaller than the one that Xerxes had led initially, it was still numerically superior to the Greek force. After an extended period of no fighting near the small city of Plataea, battle was joined when the Greeks were trying and not doing a very good job of moving camps to find more water. This led to a disjointed and disorganized battle where the Athenians and Spartans acquitted themselves well and managed to win a sloppy and confusing victory over the Persians, which also led to the death of Mardonius in battle and the dissipation of the remaining Persian forces. The Greeks were then able to liberate Thessaly, Macedon, Thrace, the Aegean Sea, etc. And most likely, this battle at humble Plataea was the most important battle of the Persian Wars. Today, we tend to focus on the heroics of Thermopylae or the significance of a naval battle on the scale of Salamis, but for Greeks at the time, it was quite obvious that it was Plataea, even more than Marathon, which was the pivotal battle of the entire conflict. After the Persian Wars, the Plataeans were able to rest on the laurels of their Persian War era glory, and effectively Plataea gained a reputation as something of a tourist stop. The Plataeans immediately after the Battle of Plataea erected a grave outside of their city gates for their own war dead. Most likely it would have looked something like the Marathon Mound that you see on the screen. The mounds at Plataea have not survived to the present, but we do have descriptions of them from the travel writer Pausanias, who saw them in the 2nd century CE. The Athenians and Spartans each set up a dedicated special area for their war dead, and that was also located near the monument for the Plataeans. The other Greeks banded together to form a common grave, and that most likely was also relatively impressive since many different poles were contributing. The Athenians, of course, had to go the extra mile and try to come up with the best monument. As with all things, this was somewhat of a competitive venture, and the Athenians were able to recruit the great poet Simonides to compose funeral verses on their mound. He was the same poet who famously composed the Ode to the Spartans at Thermopylae. Each Greek polis during the Archaic and Classical period competed with its peers to have the best and greatest temple for the gods. This competition served two purposes. One was simple civic pride. The second purpose, however, was to try to curry favor with the gods and show the greatness of one's polis. If you put sufficient resources into these temples, you would win the favor of the gods and they would reward you and your city with good fortune, prosperity, and victory in war. 
The Temple of Hera was Plataea's offering to the international Greek community, and it was their pride and joy. They went all in on this temple, despite being a polis of rather limited means when compared to some of the great powers. However, if we think about the context of Plataea being the heroes of the Persian Wars, it should come as no surprise that they were able to recruit top-tier talent, even while having a second-tier budget. Two great statues were commissioned, which were done by the renowned sculptor Praxiteles, who is better known for his work in Athens. The first of these statues portrayed Rhea presenting a stone to Kronos. This is a famous incident in Greek mythology where Rhea did not present Zeus to Kronos for him to swallow and then keep as an infant in his stomach. Instead, Rhea presented the stone and Kronos didn't notice the difference. This allowed Zeus to grow up and then overthrow his father and establish a more just rule over Olympus and then contribute to the age of men. Zeus, of course, contributed many, many bastard children to the age of men, so in addition to his role as a just ruler of the larger cosmos. There's also a massive statue of Hera, which was commissioned by Praxiteles, and this was sort of the centerpiece of this temple. After the Battle of Plataea, the Temple of Hera was supplemented by a post-battle Altar of Zeus of Freedom, and this, of course, is fitting given that Hera and Zeus were partners and also brother and sister. So it made the temple more complete, and it also worked in the fact that Plataea, in fact, played a key role in the Persian Wars, something that every other monument in the city apparently hadn't made perfectly clear before the visitor would reach this area. From the 5th century BCE all the way until the 4th century CE, Plataea was graced by yet another monument to their victory at their home city, and this was the Serpent Column. The Serpent Column was the primary celebration of the Greek victory at Plataea, and it would stand in Plataea itself for nearly a thousand years. In the 4th century CE, however, the Emperor Constantine decided to um, appropriate the site of the Greek city of Byzantium and then build his own capital there named after himself, Constantinople. He was looking for great monuments to adorn the city and one of the chief things that he appropriated was the Serpent Column. Serpent Column would really be one of the highlights during Constantine's time and for many centuries afterward. Of course, over time, this monument has degraded and at some point it broke in half. It can still be seen in modern Istanbul, but it is not featured all that prominently since it has not retained its original shape. As for Plataea itself, it was none the better off for having the Serpent Column in place during the remainder of the Classical period. Plataea effectively incurred the hatred of, per of uh, Thebes because the Thebans had become the most hated power in Greece due to their Medizing, whereas Plataea was seen as heroic. Plataea had also become much closer to Athens, the mortal enemy of Thebes. Due to this, the Thebans decided to besiege and destroy the city of Plataea early in the Peloponnesian War. This was one of the first actions of the war, in fact, and the Athenians did their utmost to help defend the city. They helped to reinforce the garrison, and they also evacuated the entire civilian population to Athens. The Plataeans were welcomed at Athens, more or less on an equal footing, all the way down until 373, when the city of Plataea was restored to its original inhabitants. The Thebans again were able to destroy the city in 373, and once again, the Plataeans found the arms of the Athenians to be open to their arrival. In both cases, despite the city being destroyed, the vast majority of the population survived and they were able to retain their Plataean heritage. After the Battle of Chironea, which we will transition to later, Philip II of Macedon, as part of his settlement of Greece, allowed the Plataeans to return to their home, and this was a part of his plan to strengthen Macedonian control at the expense of the Thebans, Athenians, and other potentially hostile powers. 
After this, the Plataeans remained at their home up until the city more or less died off in later centuries. Orchomenos was a relatively large city. Plataea was about medium-sized, maybe a little small. And now we're going to get into one of these cities, which if it hadn't been for a certain battle, would be literally completely unknown. And that city is Chironea. Chironea was a minor city in western Boeotia, not far from Orchomenos, and only about 50 miles or so removed from the great religious center at Delphi. Not surprisingly, Chironea fell under the orbit of Orchomenos by about 600 BCE, and this would have been where most of the residents of Chironea would have had to go to do most major business. In modern times, Chironea is surprisingly not all that different than it was in antiquity. It only has around 1,300 people in the present time, and it has a fair number of modern monuments to help commemorate its past, and its favorite son, who we'll get to after we discover why this city is so historically significant. This, of course, is a modern monument to commemorate the Battle of Chironea. Chironea was the site of one of the most important battles in all of Greek history. In 338, a Greek coalition led by Athens and Thebes decided to challenge Philip II of Macedon in a large-scale open battle. Leading up to this, Philip had been consolidating his power in the north, and the battle at Chironea would decide the fate of the entire Greek world. Previously, no Macedonian power had been able to really assert itself over Greece due to the instability of the Macedonian throne. However, Philip had ruled for a long time and ruled well, and he had forged the Macedonian people into the most formidable army and political force in the Greek world. The battle initially seemed to go well for the Greeks. Philip's uh, disciplined pike phalanx was slowly feigning retreat, and the Athenians thought that they had them on the run, so they began to break formation to pursue. While the Greek line was becoming ragged and a gap was opening up, the Macedonian cavalry, their striking force, uh, decided to charge through the gap. They were led by a young 18-year-old prince, named Alexander, later called Alexander the Great. His charge through the center, dividing the Theban and Athenian hoplites, proved to be decisive, and this led to the victory for the Macedonians. After this, the will of both Athens and Thebes was broken, along with that of the other Greeks who looked up to Athens and Thebes as their defenders, and this effectively allowed Philip to begin preparations for his invasion of the Persian Empire, to begin putting garrisons in key places, including the Cadmia, and to look forward to the rest of his life. In the event, however, he ended up being murdered, and we will come back to the consequences of his premature death when we talk about the ultimate fate of Thebes, the next city we're going to cover. Chironea was lucky to appear in history once given its size, but then it would spawn a famous citizen who would then make the city twice over noteworthy. This citizen was named Plutarch, and he lived from 46 to 120 CE. Without a doubt, Plutarch was easily the most famous person to ever hail from Chironea, and he was also the most famous Greek of his day. He lived at a time when there was something of an intellectual revival, so that is quite an honor for him to be the leading Greek personality of that particular period. Plutarch mostly identified as a philosopher, more specifically as a Middle Platonist. However, his more abstruse works of philosophy have not been well remembered, whereas his collection of essays, the Morelia, and his parallel lives, which are biographies of Greeks and Romans comparing their virtues and vices, have made him something of an immortal in terms of the study of ancient history. Plutarch's biographies often contain details that no other sources have preserved, and even though he is far from a good or critical historian, he is available and he does give us a whole lot of information that we otherwise would have no access to. So if you've ever studied ancient history in any depth, you know that as if you're doing anything this early period, you rely on Plutarch to at least some extent for a good deal of your information. 
Plutarch also managed to amass a considerable library at his home in Chironea, and he was able to wield significant political influence in Rome due to his international fame and his great degree of learning, which was admired by many of the elite back in Rome. Plutarch, due to his fame and fortune, was urged to leave Chironea and go somewhere where his talents would be more appreciated and where he could make a name for himself, possibly even going into Roman politics. This was around the time that the Greeks were finally admitted to Roman citizenship, or at least they could be admitted on a limited basis. And it seems that Plutarch, had he so chosen, could have entered the Roman Senate. However, he was not inclined to do so. When he was urged to move, Plutarch displayed the old classical polis mentality. He said that he loved Chironea too much to make it one citizen the poorer, and therefore he would stay in his home and try to enrich it as best he could. By this point in the video, most of you have probably noticed that all things serve the beam, and in the context of Boeotia, that beam leads straight to Thebes. Thebes was the largest and most powerful city in Boeotia by a long shot, eclipsing the power of Orchomenos and its allies who were like-minded. Famously, Thebes had seven gates on its city walls. Most likely, this was a development of the historical period, and it was then um, retroactively added to Theban mythology. The main conflict in Theban history, without a doubt, is its rivalry with Athens, since this is something which happened over a number of different centuries and which really played a big role in Theban ambitions to try to unify Boeotia. Due to this rivalry and its importance to both sides, uh, Thebes was often a major setting for Athenian plays. The Athenians were often hesitant to set their plays at home because Athens didn't really have that great of a mythological past one but also sometimes the playwrights would not want to overly politicize something while also kind of wanting to have a political message. And one way to strike that balance is to set your play in a different place. So Athenians would often write about Thebes in the mythological period. We know that sometimes they were taking liberties with the, out, the layout of Thebes because sometimes the way that they describe the city doesn't quite add up if you're familiar with the layout of Thebes itself. However, it served its purpose as a mythical setting and plays about Theban mythological history such as the plays about Oedipus clearly went over quite well with Athenian audiences decade after decade. Politically speaking, Thebes was primarily an oligarchy for most of its history. However, during the period at which it was most famous and prosperous, it was a democracy and it had this democracy by the 370s and quickly went about spreading it to other Boeotian centers. So when Thebes went democratic for the first time in the 380s or 70s, they took the rest of Boeotia with them. And for most Boeotians, this was also their first brush with democracy. Without a doubt, what ended up being the decisive event in Theban history was their decision to Medize and 480. And because this decision was so controversial for the rest of Theban history, I think that it's worth exploring in detail. The Thebans may very well have joined with their fellow Greeks against the Persians, if only Xerxes had been held up in Thermopylae Pass. As it was, however, the Persians broke out of Thermopylae and directly into Boeotia. This meant that Thebes was the obvious first target of Persian aggression, and the Thebans knew they had no way to hold off such a force for a long period of time. Even if their walls held, they would be cut off from their countryside and then forced to surrender or starve. They also knew that with Thermopylae gone and with the previous efforts to stop the Persians in the north having failed, that the odds of the Greeks actually winning a victory in the end were not very high. The Thebans therefore decided to capitulate, or in the eyes of their critics, they Medized. That is to say that they gave in to the Medes. It would seem that most of the Greeks didn't really understand the difference between the Medes and the Persians. And granted, since both were part of the ruling class, that difference was largely irrelevant if you weren't a Mede or a Persian. 
But at any rate, this would be more or less the label that was thrown up in the faces of the Thebans for the rest of their history. While the decision clearly was far from heroic on the part of Thebes, we have to remember that unlike Athens, Thebes had a choice. It had not offended Persia nearly as much. It had not defeated them at Marathon or intervened in the Ionian Revolt. And unlike Sparta, Thebes had also not decided to kick an ambassador down a well. Also significantly, and unlike Athens once again, the Thebans had no recourse to the sea. The Athenians actually thought about relocating their entire polis to Italy in order to avoid the wrath of the Persians, and they used this as leverage to get their way with the Spartans, Corinthians, and others who wanted to pursue a more conservative strategy. Thebes had no such options, so they made the decision which was best for them under the circumstances, and that was to look out for the safety and security of the Theban people by surrendering to Persia rather than being butchered. Many Poles Medized, in fact, more Poles Medized than fought on the, quote, Greek side of the Persian War. However, few if any other Poles took as much grief for their Medizing as the Thebans did. This would be something that would be thrown up in their faces over and over again, and it would do legitimate diplomatic harm to Thebes since many cities would consider them to be untrustworthy due to the Medizing of their ancestors in the 5th century. The victorious Greek alliance after the war removed Thebes from leadership in Boeotia due to their treachery to Halas as a whole. It would take many years for the Thebans to undo this damage and to reestablish its hold on Boeotia. This time it would not be nearly so benevolent with its neighbors as it had been initially, and it would make very little pretense of sharing power with them. The rivalry between Boeotia and Athens dated back to at least 508-507, when the Cleisthenic reforms in Athens had created a democracy. One of the ousted dynasts named Isagoras had gone to Thebes to get help, and the Boeotians had therefore invaded Attica to try to overthrow democracy, but they had been repulsed. Ever since then, there had been some tension between Athens and Thebes. After the Persian War, this will greatly intensify. While if you look on a map, it's clear that the majority of Athens' military activity between the Persian War and the Peloponnesian War was in the Aegean, and that's where they made the majority of their gains, the Athenians by mid-century were beginning to develop ambitions to create an overland empire to supplement its huge naval empire. And much of this empire would come at the expense of Thebes. Since Boeotia was no longer occupied by the Thebans as a whole, and there were plenty of powers in Boeotia, including Plataea, which had good feelings toward Athens, the Athenians knew that they had the possibility of invading and annexing chunks of Boeotia and possibly of an, establishing a new Boeotian League with themselves at the head and uniting against the common enemy of Thebes, who again had Medized and was untrustworthy. This would result in what is called the First Peloponnesian War. This is one of the many causes of that conflict. And while Sparta was involved on the side of the Thebans, for the most part, this conflict was a war between Athens on the one hand and Sparta's allies, Boeotia and Corinth on the other. In this case, it was mostly Thebes and some of the Boeotians versus the Athenians and others of the Boeotians, to put it more properly. This war doesn't have a very clear course to it. However, in 457, the war sort of hit its peak. That year, the Boeotians, with the help of the Spartans who happened to be in the area, were able to defeat the Athenians in a pitched hoplite battle at Tanagra, which is also located near the Attic border. The Athenians retreated in defeat, and then the Spartans left for home. When that happened, the Athenians decided to chance battle with the Thebans once again, returning to win a victory at Anaphita. Going into the Peloponnesian War, Athens and Boeotia raided each other and sought strongholds in the territory of the other. The conflict between them was becoming increasingly vicious, and each one was looking to do serious damage to the other. 
Um, this is why the first move that the Thebans made was to order their fellow Boeotians to begin attacking against uh, Plataea. After the Athenians tried and failed to seize the Boeotian town of Delian in 224, the Boeotian League reformed, this time clearly under Theban leadership. Effectively, what occurred is that by trying to exploit Boeotian dissatisfaction with Thebes, Athens effectively created support for Thebes. After being invaded and having to deal with the consequences of pitched battles over a few decades, the Boeotians decided that submission to Thebes was safer for them than trying to side with Athens. They also by this point realized that the Athenians were not always the kindest masters and that they wouldn't necessarily be any better off under the thumb of Athens than they would under the thumb of their fellow Boeotians the Thebans. The year after the Battle of Delian in 424, the Boeotians decided to form a league together. Previously, they had been frightened of Theban ambitions and Theban trustworthiness due to the Medizing incident, but now they decided that they all needed to band together in the face of continued Athenian hostility. What they did was to set up a sort of federal system which was balanced in theory but in practice set the stage for a Theban empire. This Boeotian League was set up to where there were 11 political units. Sometimes it would just be a single polis. Other times it would be groups of polis together acting as one unit. And each of these units would elect one Boeotarch to the Council of Boeotarchs. They also would send counselors separately acting as a kind of legislature to Thebes. In times of war, there was a league army for Boeotia and each of the units would contribute 1,000 infantry and 100 cavalry. One interesting thing about these numbers for the cavalry is that by having 1,100 cav in total, this gave them a 100 man advantage over the standing corps at Athens. So this was a significant development. In terms of infantry, they would have fallen short of the Athenians, but we have to remember that Athens had lost quite a few men to the plague by this time, one, and also that Thebes most likely could turn out more men in addition to the 1,000 or so that they were officially responsible for. This league had a somewhat limited amount of um, authority in the sense that there was no coercive mechanism at the upper end among the Boeotarchs. Any decision that the Boeotarchs and council made had to then be ratified by every oligarchic council and every polis in Boeotia. At this time, all of the cities of Boeotia were oligarchies, so most likely these were elites who kind of thought alike and had some fairly similar views on the world. That being said, you can imagine how difficult enacting any sort of real reform would be in a system with so many checks and balances, but also so few ways to actually enact any kind of change. If you're more interested in this topic, I suggest that you check out Boeotia and the Boeotian League by Robert J. Buck. He's an excellent scholar, and his biography of Thrasybulus of Athens is truly exceptional, and also something that I would recommend to anyone. Over the long course of the Peloponnesian War, the Boeotians did their fair share of fighting against Athens, but they also did some internal fighting. The consequence of these internal conflicts is that Thebes was able to eliminate or annex Boeotian League members that it found to be insufficiently loyal to Boeotia as a whole. And when they would conquer and subdue these areas, what they would do is replace local Boeotarchs with people loyal to Thebes, sometimes Thebans uh, proper. So by 395, the balance of power in the League had been broken, and it was effectively Boeotia and its allies rather than a Boeotian League in any meaningful sense. This is part of why Orchomenos was so willing to break away from the Boeotian League in 395. By that same time, the Thebans had grown increasingly discontent with Spartan leadership. In 404, at the conclusion of the Peloponnesian War, both Corinth and Thebes had called for the destruction of Athens, but Sparta had refused, instead making Athens a subject state under the Thirty Tyrants.
Thebes then changed its mind and rather than calling for Athens to be destroyed, ended up housing democratic exiles under Thrasybulus and then helping them in their quest to return to Athens and wage a civil war against the Thirty. Perhaps they were simply trying to weaken Athens through further warfare, or maybe they thought that this would give Sparta an excuse to stamp out the city. At any rate, the Spartans had an internal command problem between General Lysander and King Pausanias, which resulted in the Spartans approving of the return of democracy at Athens. So this would, of course, in the over the long haul, lead to the recovery of Athens as a major rival for Thebes. Athens would never quite be the same, but they would once again be able to balance out Theban power. In 395, Athens, uh, Thebes and Corinth decided that they had had enough of Sparta's arrogance and Sparta's interventions in other poles. So fearing that they themselves would be the subject of Spartan aggression sooner rather than later, they waited until Agesilaus was away in Anatolia and then collected some Persian money and revolted. This alliance of Thebes and Corinth put Sparta in an awkward situation as Agesilaus' army was quite a bit removed from the Greek world. A Persian fleet under an Athenian admiral then defeated the Spartan fleet thus leaving Agesilaus without any means of rapid transit back to Greece. Agesilaus was able to make an epic return march after selling out all of Greek Ionia to the Persians, and then he arrived and was able to save the day in the end. However, the Corinthian War is a close-run affair, and it was only when Sparta was able to divert the gold flow away from the other Greeks to themselves that they were able to impose the Peace of Antalcidas. This effectively restored Plataea and then put obstacles in the way of Theban domination, but it was hardly something that was fatal to Theban ambitions. After 387, Thebes had an outright policy of uniting Boeotia under its own leadership, with no pretense of it being a shared Boeotian adventure, and also of fighting Sparta, who it now regarded as a geopolitical rival, which was hostile to Theban ambitions in Boeotia. Despite the fact that the Peace of Antalcidas is named after a Spartan ambassador, the Spartans did not adhere to the terms of this peace, and within a couple of years they had successfully brought about a coup in Thebes, which then caused a civil war. Theban self-government would not be restored until the early, or I mean late, 380s, so think around 382 or so. At that time, Thebes became a democracy in contrast with its earlier oligarchy, and along with this innovation in its type of government, the Thebans also began to experiment militarily. During the late phases of the Peloponnesian War and into the 4th century, there was quite a bit of experimentation militarily in the Greek world. Most of these experiments involve what we would now call combined arms, that is combining hoplites with lighter troops in order to create more full and flexible armies. Other innovations included things like siege equipment, um, using peltos, light-armed troops who were more mobile than hoplites. But one thing that no one else had ever thought of is changing up hoplite tactics in a meaningful way. Most Greeks were fully convinced that the basic hoplite tactic of stacking seven deep and trying to win a victory on the right flank was simply the way that hoplites had to fight. However, this is something that the Thebans decided was not a hard and fast rule. They began to experiment with variations on this, varying up the depth of wings, maybe attacking on the left, doing other things like that. Perhaps more importantly, however, the Thebans began to train with their phalanx on a regular basis. This is something that only the Spartans did. So the Thebans went from being more or less tied for second best hoplites in Greece with the Athenians and a few other powers, and then moved up to a very firm second competing for first with Sparta. So not only did they begin to experiment with mixing up their depth or doing maneuvers that hoplites hadn't done earlier, but they also were just simply getting out there and drilling on a regular basis, which was, as I said, probably more important. One of the key new units for all of this was a standing force called the Sacred Band of Thebes. Uh, 
This unit is somewhat notorious because it is supposedly composed of 150 couples, 300 men in total, and the idea is that these men must have been lovers in the homosexual sense. Now, undoubtedly, many of them were homosexuals. However, um, the word lover in Greek doesn't necessarily imply a sexual or romantic love. These could simply, in some cases, be friends. So not all of the men in the sacred band were necessarily homosexual in the way that we think of it today. Although it was by no means impossible that some of them were. And in fact, it's pretty certain that quite a number of them would have engaged in what we would now think of as gay acts. So anyway, this band though was a tightly wound unit which um, where the idea is that each man would be standing next to his lover and would be willing to fight to the death for that man. So this unit had quite a bit of camaraderie and they also took their pride of place in the Theban order of battle very seriously. Most of these men were from fairly well-off families, so they also were fighting for the glory of their family and their family name. This unit would distinguish itself in battle after battle, right up until it was more or less annihilated at Chironia. But before that, the Sacred Band was one of the most feared units in the entirety of Greece. And the only person who really critiqued it was Xenophon, who was a little bit homophobic, because he thought that having lovers fight side by side would be bad for discipline. However, the result seemed to prove Xenophon wrong, as the sacred band time and again acquitted itself brilliantly. Theban democracy, during the trials and travails in which it was born and then rose to prominence, produced two great statesmen generals. The first of them is Pelopidas. Pelopidas was a renowned athlete in his youth. In 384, another soldier, Epaminondas, saved his life in one of the various battles with the Spartans, and the two of them became lifelong friends and political partners. They would work together for the rest of their respective lives. In 382, Pelopidas was the man who led Theban exiles back from Athens in order to restore Theban home rule and then set up the democracy. Pelopidas was someone who was well known for having an aesthetic lifestyle and for being excessively generous to beggars. Supposedly, he was so generous to beggars that it was hard to tell the difference between the way that a beggar who had met Pelopidas dressed and a member of his own family. In 375, Pelopidas won a small battle over the Spartans, which sent shockwaves throughout the Greek world, since it was still more or less believed that the Spartans were basically invincible. This was the first sign that change was in the offing. In 371, at the Battle of Leuctra, Pelopidas commanded the Sacred Band, but more on that in a minute. After Leuctra, when, Sp when Thebes had become the new hegemon of Greece, Pelopidas was tasked with dealing with the Northern Front. Effectively, at this time, Thebes was fighting a three-front war. In the east, they had to face the Athenians. In the south, they were still dealing with Sparta. And in the north, they had to deal with Thessaly and Macedon. In the 360s, the Thebans under Pelopidas were dealing with the north, and he intervened in both Thessaly and Macedon. He was more or less playing a kingmaker in this uh, arena. And his job, more or less, was to try to keep Macedon more or less unstable. One of the people he brought back with him as a hostage was a young and impressionable Philip II. Supposedly, Philip II and Pelopidas became lovers when Philip returned to, with him to Thebes. Pelopidas was destined to die in battle, as was befitting of a warrior statesman. His goal in this battle was to slay Alexander of Foray, a Thessalian tyrant, in personal combat, but he was cut down by Alexander's bodyguards while he was making the attempt. The other great statesman during the Theban hegemony was Epaminondas. As I mentioned earlier, he became best friends with Pelopidas during a battle in 384, and the two of them would remain close for 20-something years. He was different than Pelopidas, even though they worked together on a frequent basis. Pelopidas was more of a soldier's general and a, the kind of guy who would always lead the charge and try to accomplish heroic deeds with his own person. 
Epaminondas was more reserved and more intellectual than his colleague. Epaminondas's concerns tended to be more on the grand strategic scale, and unlike his colleague who mostly focused on the north, Epaminondas's abiding obsession was with curbing the power of Sparta. Epaminondas was the field commander at Leuctra, the most important battle in Theban history, where the Thebans shattered the Spartan phalanx, inflicting heavy casualties and forever breaking the myth of Spartan invincibility. The next year after the Battle of Leuctra, Epaminondas led a large Theban army into the Peloponnese and liberated Messenia, the area that Sparta had ruled over for 300 years and effectively worked as a kind of slave colony. Without Messenia, Sparta did not have the economic basis to sustain its Peloponnesian League or any of its territorial ambitions. And by severing Messenia and, and founding the city of Megalopolis to rule over Messenia, what Epaminondas did was forever neuter Sparta and Spartan power. At the Battle of Mantinea in 362, Epaminondas died in a bloody draw against the combined forces of Athens and Sparta. Yes, after Leuctra, Thebes had become so dominant that Athens and Sparta actually put aside all of their long-standing differences to fight on the same side, and they would fight shoulder to shoulder against the Thebans at Mantinea. During this time, the 360s, a young Philip II of Macedon lived as a hostage with Epaminondas and learned the art of war from him. As I mentioned earlier, he supposedly was lovers with Pelopidas. By studying under these two great masters, under being, uh, you know, obviously not an accidental word choice, Philip learned the art of war and learned it very well. Being in this environment where people experimented with hoplite depth and mixing up hoplite tactics was absolutely pivotal to Philip's development as a military thinker. Almost immediately upon his assumption of the throne, Philip began to heavily reform the Macedonian army and to implement a new pike-based phalanx, which would fundamentally change the nature of his army into something that the Greek world had not seen before. Philip would also be the first of the Greeks to fully master combined arms, something that the Thebans and Athenians and others had experimented with, but had never quite, and got, quite gotten down to a fine art. To take a step back now that we've explored the careers of Pelopidas and Epaminondas, Thebes held hegemony in the Greek world as a whole for nine years. From about 371 to 362, Thebes was by far the dominant power in the Greek world. So this would date from the time of the Battle of Leuctra down to the death of Epaminondas at Mantinea. During this time, despite it being so short, Thebes accomplished a great deal. It was able to effectively break up the Peloponnesian League, Sparta's long-standing alliance network which dated back to the 6th century. By 370 to 369, Thebes was able to so thoroughly neuter Sparta that it scared Athens into siding with Sparta lest Thebes become too powerful and establish its rule over all of Greece. Effectively, what Thebes then did was to wage a three-front war successfully, winning battle after battle, for almost a decade, and this was largely due to the military reforms and then generalship of Pelopidas and Epaminondas. While a nine-year hegemony doesn't sound that impressive, we do have to remember the circumstances and think about how difficult it would be to maintain a three-front war for a decade, and do so with great success. After the death of the two great generals, however, Theban power and prestige would dramatically decline. Once Epaminondas went cold in 362, the Thebans found themselves without the kind of military leadership they required to maintain their hegemony. Being in the middle of Greece makes it hard to have imperial ambitions, and ultimately the ambitions of Thebes failed. Thebes was then challenged for dominance by Thessaly, Athens, and Macedon. By the mid-century, Athens had largely recovered from the Peloponnesian War and was once again a major player in the Greek world. Sparta, by this point, was more or less broken, but it, it too could potentially pose a threat. 
There also were other rising powers near Thebes, like the Aetolian League, but we needn't get into them too much. The point is that in the years after the death of Epaminondas, Thebes remained a major player, and it certainly controlled Boeotia with a few notable exceptions and periods of revolt, but while it did have considerable power, it was not powerful enough to drive international events or to exercise political hegemony outside of Boeotia on any kind of consistent basis. Thebes had fallen back to being just one of several major regional players. At first, it appears that the fears of the Greeks in the south about Philip of Macedon were largely allayed by the strong belief that just like many of his ancestors, he would be assassinated by one of his brothers, cousins, or some other royal relative before he was able to get anywhere close to Greece with his newly impressive army. Macedon, or so the saying went, was an absolute monarchy tempered by assassination. And people thought it was just a matter of time before Philip ate a blade. Ultimately, they were correct, but it was too late to help the Greek world. As Philip II of Macedon gained control of Thessaly and Thrace during the 340s, the Boeotians became increasingly receptive to the Athenian call led by Demosthenes for a united front to stop Philip. By the time that Athens called Thebes to its side, Macedon was simply too strong for either polis to fight on its own. However, when they combined their forces, they had quite a few men to field, and they had a reasonable chance of defeating Philip in a head-to-head -head battle. The problem is that Philip's army was far more professional than the Greek force, and it used its combined arms far better. In terms of pure numbers, however, they were relatively evenly matched with a slight edge to the Greek alliance. The clash between Philip and the Greeks occurred at Chironea. We've already discussed this battle in detail and how Alexander and the companion cavalry struck the key blow in the battle. Effectively, the Battle of Chironea ended Theban control over Boeotia. This was one of the first things that Philip moved to break up, and he also installed a Macedonian garrison in the Cadmia to ensure the good behavior of the Thebans. In 336, however, Philip was assassinated while celebrating yet another wedding. He was planning on invading Persia, but this, of course, interrupted his plans, and Alexander then had to deal with some local revolts while also trying to establish himself on the throne. Alexander was away on the Danube, crushing some locals, and there were rumors that he had died in battle, just like his father. This led to premature celebrations in Thebes, where the locals seized the garrison at the Cadmia and massacred them. Then they proudly proclaimed their independence and began to celebrate. Before they knew it, however, someone unexpected arrived at Thebes with some very bad news. It appears, at least if the historian Arian is to be believed, that the first confirmation of Alexander's continued existence that the Thebans received was when he marched with his army and camped in front of the gates of the city. This, of course, created a mass panic, and the Thebans rushed to arms and decided to defend their city to the last. Alexander, for his part, knew that if he ever wanted to invade Persia as his father had wanted to do, he would need to keep Greece quiescent, and apparently they had not learned their lesson from Chironea. Accordingly, Alexander decided to storm the city of Thebes and then kill most of the inhabitants, selling the survivors into slavery and then raising the city. This was a very harsh punishment, but given what the Thebans had done to the Macedonian garrison, it doesn't seem excessively harsh or all that surprising. However, his official excuse for massacring Thebes the way he did was not that he wanted to teach the Greeks a lesson or avenge his garrison, but rather that he was about to embark on a great crusade to avenge the Persian invasion of Greece, and the first act in this great undertaking would be to punish Thebes for its decision to Medize so many years before. So he was able to use the Medizing of the Thebans as his official excuse for laying waste and destroying this entire city. Of course, when I say he destroyed this entire city, there is one notable exception. There was one structure that 
he left untouched, and this was the hut of the poet Pindar. Pindar had lived from 518 down to about 438 or so BCE, and while his hut was not that impressive, it was a major local landmark since he had written some poems which had become legendary within the Greek world since his death. He is credited with writing some of the classic paeans that the Greeks would sing before battle and on special religious occasions. Ironically enough, it may very well have been one of his odes that the Macedonians sang before they sacked Thebes. So, uh, Alexander did have a mind for Greek culture, so he left the hut of Pindar standing while also crushing Thebes in its entirety. In subsequent years, Alexander apparently felt guilty about his treatment of Thebes, and he would be generous to Thebans he encountered on his campaigns, often giving them uh, bonuses for discharge and then sending them home to live out the remainder of their lives in Greece and relative prosperity. To conclude our history of Thebes, I would like to consider the most prominent defensive structure in all of Boeotia, the Theban Cadmia, the ancient Acropolis of Thebes. The Cadmia had been the center of Mycenaean Thebes and had been continuously inhabited through the Greek Dark Ages. Alexander, of course, destroyed the Cadmia, but this rise in the terrain remained and it was quickly rebuilt. In 316, the new ruler of Macedon, Cassander, decided to rebuild both the Cadmia and the seven gated walls of Thebes so that he could establish a garrison at Boeotia and maintain better control of the Greek world. After Cassander's reconstructions at Thebes and the return of some of the Thebans from slavery and from the campaign in the east as mercenaries on either side, we see that Thebes slowly grew back, but not at a very quick rate. Thebes had returned to some kind of prosperity by about the 80s BCE, but Sulla arrived to drive off Mithridates and the Pontic army, and while he was in Greece, he plundered freely. He did quite a bit of damage to Thebes during this time, and this was something that Thebes would never quite recover from, at least according to the travel writer Pausanias, who came a couple hundred years after this. By Pausanias' day in the 2nd century CE, only the Cadmia was inhabited. This means that over time, Thebes effectively started out on the Cadmia, expanded outward, contracted, and then expanded outward again, and then by the end of antiquity, it had once again contracted to no more than it had held during the Greek Dark Ages. Pausanias says that anything outside of the Cadmia was effectively a ghost town by the second century. Most of the rest of Boeotia, by the way, seems to have been doing quite fine. It was just Thebes which was sadly abandoned. I suppose that Alexander, the Athenians, and others who heavily criticized the Thebans for their act of Medizing must have been laughing the whole time as they looked down upon Thebes, the sad ghost town, which was now just the Cadmia and nothing else.